uh, we have a great lineup of speakers for you today, five speakers, and um, we're going to start it off with Bob Sterner uh, from the Large Lakes Observatory, the University of Minnesota in, in Duluth. And Bob literally wrote the book on ecological stoichiometry, so we're really um, thrilled to have him here to start off our session and introduce us to this topic. So thanks, Bob. Hi, everybody. My mic it works great. Um, huge thanks to Debbie and Mike for inviting me here. I have every year looked at the announcement for the OCB workshop and said, you know, I really need to go to that. That looks like a lot of fun. And so it's terrific to have this uh, extra excuse to be here today in Redfield Hall. So I'm a little, uh, you know, I'm a little humbled here um, to be uh, kicking this session off. Um, so my role in the beginning of this really is to kind of lay a foundation for the rest of the speakers. Um, I, um, I did have a lot, of, a lot to do with, a lot of work uh, that I did uh, helped sort of found the field of ecological stoichiometry. I'm very proud of that. You're going to hear about some of those classic studies from me today. By the end of my talk, we'll be getting into a little bit of more recent work um, but really, my role is to provide that kind of solid foundation uh, for the other speakers. So it's, it's a little weird for me to come to a workshop like this and really talk about uh, studies that are some years old. Uh, but I hope it'll help pull this whole session together uh, in, a, in a great way. Thanks to Debbie for saying I wrote the book. Um, I'm glad Jim Elser isn't here to hear her say that, um, <laughs> because I would never hear the end of it. Um, Jim and I had this spectacular partnership in pulling that book together and other things that we did, and it's really a treasure of my life to have worked with him in the way I did, and we're still often in touch. So with no further ado, um, the title that I sort of chose or was given or some, uh, uh, the title emphasizes consumer-driven nutrient recycling, and you'll hear more about that than anything else in my talk, but I'm really trying to kind of lay the whole foundation for all of stoichiometry, not just uh, nutrient recycling work. So that's where we're going today, and um, let's do it. So um, I don't want anybody to like go screaming out of the room or anything during my talk. Um, Debbie already mentioned that uh, the vast majority of my work is in fresh water, um, has been in fresh water. I have worked with oceanic data sets, and being a Great Lakes researcher, <coughs> Um, it's been a, really a huge benefit to me as a scientist to at least have part of one foot in the oceanographic world um, because it's given me an opportunity to interact with a couple of pretty distinct communities of scholars who have very different approaches to science in general. So the sort of freshwater world and the ecological world approaches science in very different ways than almost everybody in this room does. I, I think of what oceanography does is trying to figure out how the ocean works. Um, and in freshwater and ecological studies, they phrase their purpose in science in a different way. It's kind of more abstract and more theoretical and hypothesis driven. That's a complicated topic. Anyway, I didn't make much of an attempt to put a salty stuff into this uh, talk. So it's kind of little o capital CB. <laughs> You'll hear a lot of CB, uh, and I hope that's enough. You know, it's two-thirds of the stoichiometry, so. Um, this is, uh, you know, there's a bunch of definitions floating around, and I use different ones. It's, this is one of my favorites today, mass balance of multiple conserved substances in ecological interactions. And the kind of elevator speech I have, or, you know, how do you explain what you do to your grandmother kind of thing? is I usually say that I'm interested in how the nutrient content of organisms shapes their ecology. So we take this incredibly beautiful but complicated thing, which is a living organism that does all this amazing stuff and many things we've heard about already in this workshop and reacts in an adaptive way to its world and has an evolutionary history and performs almost you know, incomprehensibly, staggeringly uh, complicated things with biochemistry and everything. And we distill all of that into, well, how much phosphorus is in that cell? 
are in that organism? How much nitrogen is in it? How much of ecology can we understand with this very simple measure of the nutrient content of organisms? How far will that take us? We obviously leave certain important things behind when we use that simplification, but how far can it go? Can we go with that? And I think the answer is we can go really pretty amazingly far and see things that we never saw before by using this lens of stoichiometry. So um, there, is, there are stoichiometric stories to tell throughout all levels of organization from molecules all the way to the globe. Um, and the book I wrote with Jim kind of goes along that whole um, sequence of levels of organization. Um, there's interesting stuff to say in many papers written about biochemical stoichiometry and how that shapes organism um, content, how global changes of nutrient cycling and temperature and other things feed back into the rest of ecology. Um, we could talk about all of this. We don't have time today. My, uh, my talk is really going to be oriented down here, which I still, the, the organism. To me, the organism really is the central player in ecological stoichiometry. It's about the nutrient content of organisms. But there are things that feed into that and feed back and likewise up to the larger scale. So there's stoichiometric stories all over the place. But today, I will be down here mostly. The other speakers will go up and down scale too. So you'll hear about a lot of this. Um, and there he is. I couldn't resist um, <clears throat> mentioning again um, you know, when I go back and read, and I just reread Ketchum, uh, 1960, was it two? Um, a very short paper on nutrient recycling. I pulled that out because I knew I was coming here and Woods Hole and all that. It's amazing how far Redfield and his colleagues went in this field with, with almost no data. I mean, we live in a world of big data, you know, big data and data sets that, you know, that plug up the internet when you move them around. And they, they created so much out of a handful of measurements of uh, zooplankton nutrient content and other things. Um, really speaks to the genius of the group that did this here. Um, so here's a recent paper by Zoe Finkel et al. to kind of help set the stage. We have nutrients, we have this sort of, uh, you know, organisms interacting and the focus today is on uh, multiple substances, and especially the higher trophic levels. Um, and in a way, what we're trying to do is unpack that box and say, uh, what are the functional couplings? How do we understand these interactions? And especially, how do we overlay multiple cycles on top of each other? So carbon and biogeochemistry. What does that mean in a deep way when we combine those things? It's not just carbon. It's not just nutrients. Those things are linked as they move through food webs. They're linked as they move through ecosystems. And what are those linkages and how does that shape the whole uh, behavior of the entire system? Those are the kind of questions that we want to try to address. Uh, it's a highly multidimensional problem. And I'm trained as a biologist and I'm very sympathetic to my sort of more physically based colleagues who they ask me a question about biology, and the answer from me almost always is, it depends. And it's very frustrating to someone who's working with kinetic energy or something to always hear, well, it depends on what organism you're talking about, blah, 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 blah. And, in fa you know, it is, it, oops, it is true. There's, uh, each species here is doing something different from maybe every other species, and we're making the problem worse by including multiple substances. So one of the themes I have for you is how do we deal with this as scientists? How do we take this, this thing that's already very multidimensional because there's many species, and then we multiply that by the number of elements of interest? We're really setting ourselves up for some stiff challenges to try to make progress because there's so many possibilities. I have something to say about that by the end. Um, I, in some ways, my story starts here. Consumers are important as nutrient recyclers. I, th I think anyone who's looked at this at all lately w would easily accept that fact because there's lots of literature on it now. 
Uh, we go back to Ketchum, as I just mentioned. In, in my land, um, John Lehman's work in 1980 was instrumental. He showed that zooplankton uh, provide most of the nutrients that are used by phytoplankton in the mixed layer of lakes. Uh, so this idea of a recycling system, um, it's oops, continues today to Mike Fanny and Carla Atkinson's here uh, today to talk. Um, so uh, how do we think about these higher trophic levels? They're not just consumers. Um, they're functionally integrated in systems where uh, nutrients are turning over multiple times. We have to uh, incorporate that in our thinking. Um, and kind of the question that goes back to the multidimensional problem is might we build up an understanding species by species, wiring in measured values as we study this copepod here and we see how fast it grows and how much it eats and how much it excretes. Okay, we've measured this. Can we just sort of plug that into a model and then take species two, species three? You know, where do we go with that? I think that's not the way to proceed, but it, uh, it in some ways is kind of how most of biogeochemistry works sort of box by box, study that box, put it together into some bigger model. But I think the, the real understanding comes in the functional couplings, couplings that emerge at a higher scale of organization. Um, sorry about that. That's a freshwater organism. Um, but I think we'll all agree it's way cuter than a copepod. Uh, I mean, it looks like a little person. It looks like a little person, come on. Um, so the organism's at the center of the story today, and um, what I want you to think about is this critter, um, some kind of member of the higher trophic levels, and it's ingesting food, uh, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and many other things, but I, I tend to focus on those three elements. And uh, one thing that happens with that food that it eats is there's a delta for biomass some of the food that it's ingested goes into growth. And the amount that goes into growth, I think, is really key. And that, uh, that, the, how fast that critter is growing, I think, provides a lot more um, information than we've given it credit for to today. So I'm going to come back to that delta several times. And then whatever doesn't go into growth goes back to the environment. Um, and it's a simple mass balance. It's not any elegant, you know, hypothesis that we have to test. It's mass balance. It's, you know, it, it's conservation of matter. Um, and so at some level, all of this has to be right because it's based on conservation of matter. The question is, is it interesting and useful kind of stuff? Um, so one of, the, one of the really important studies to me early on, this came out when I was a postdoc. Uh, and it was by Ingvar Olsen, uh, published in 1986. And they studied nutrient recycling by Daphne. It was in an enclosure experiment, and they had multiple cultured foods. And we won't care so much about where the data came from. But what they did was they, they examined uh, this, thing, this complicated looking thing, which is the amount of phosphorus excreted by zooplankton uh, divided by the amount of food that they ate. Phosphorus excreted divided by carbon ingested. And then they plotted it as a function of the phosphorus to carbon ratio of the food. So phosphorus rich foods out here, phosphorus poor food is here. And if these animals work like independent little, um, there's a carbon balance and then there's a phosphorus balance, then the data would be on a straight horizontal line but they the data clearly aren't. The, the amount of phosphorus that's being released per food ingested is a linear relationship here. And most significantly, it, it never gets to zero, but it sort of would extrapolate to zero. Essentially, the animal shuts down nutrient recycling or comes very close to shutting down nutrient recycling when it's eating phosphorus deficient food. This is a very smart thing for any living thing to do is to, is to retain efficiently the substance that's very scarce in its environment. And doing anything else would be wasteful and would be penalized evolutionarily. So, I mean, this, this graph is saying this is an adaptive critter that is doing things biogeochemically that make perfect sense for it 
as uh, in terms of it trying to be successful in its world. It's not a passive transducer of anything. It's not a battery. It's not a spring. It's reacting to its environment in ways that affect the coupling of carbon and phosphorus through the ecosystem. This was a spectacular thing. I remember thinking about this study day after day after day. What does this mean? How, how do I, because I was, you know, spending my days thinking about nutrient recycling, and this graph just sort of made me pivot. Um, it's not a small effect. There's something like a tenfold difference there in phosphorus released divided by carbon ingested. So uh, I've already made that point. This is not the easiest thing to work with, is it? Here we go. Um, yeah, so that's what I just said. Uh, the next study that I want to mention here was done by my close colleague, Jim Elser, uh, who looked at, who was working in the Trophic Cascade project of Steve Carpenter's. So, you know, we, in their case, they had big bass that they had added to some lakes, and they studied the whole um, uh, set of interactions from fish to plankton to algae. And what Elser did in that group is he looked at the biogeochemistry that was associated with these food web shifts. So these investigators were doing food web manipulations in different lakes, collecting lots of data and lots of things. And Elser came along and said, well, what's going on biogeochemically when we change the top predator of this ecosystem? Do we see anything at the, you know, in terms of nutrient recycling in these different systems? And um, this is one of the highlights of the study that he published in LNO with other colleagues in 88. And these are different measures of nitrogen versus phosphorus limitation or availability. Um, AER is something to do with ammonium, and this is APA or uh, alkaline phosphatase activity. But basically, um, points up here represent uh, ecosystems that are strongly nitrogen deficient and points down low are points that are strongly phosphorus deficient um, and um, what he found and what they found working together in this project is when the community was dominated by small grazers small herbivores that community became nitrogen limited and when uh, the food web shifted and large grazers dominated, uh, the ecosystem became phosphorus limited. So these upper trophic levels, which is the theme of today, what are they doing? Uh, they were having effects that propagated all the way to the primary producers, and in some ways sort of beyond, in terms of the nutrients that recycle in the system. Um, and uh, yeah, so those, those are the points. Now, a spectacular study, and I remember meeting Jim about the time this study came out, and he's admitted uh, that at the time they did this, they had no idea how it worked. It was just a phenomenological observation, but they really couldn't explain why N limitation in one place and P limitation in another. And then um, thinking about the Olson work that I've already described with nutrient recycling, the ELSA results, and other things. Um, I sat down over several days and wrote out some analytical models of nutrient recycling, asking the question, if we, if we just think about the simple mass balance, we have the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio of an organism, of the herbivore, we have the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio of the food it eats, uh, if we know those two things, what's going in and what the organism is, what can we say about what's being recycled, what's coming out? And the key point here was this concept of homeostasis. So if animals' biomass simply reflected what they ate, if you are what you eat, then um, you can do a mass balance, but it's kind of boring. Everything's kind of linear and easily predictable and stuff. But that's not how biology works. Homeostasis is the hallmark of life. No matter what the living organism is, it tries to maintain some semblance of its own configuration against a variable external world. And so that homeostasis generated some really interesting things theoretically. And so the, the you are what you eat relationship would be a straight line here. The nitrogen to phosphorus released 
against the nitrogen to phosphorus that was consumed would be uh, a straight line, but that's not what the model said. When we put homeostasis into the model, then, um, then we get these curves. And in fact, at low N to P, when the organism's eating low N to P food, it should retain more nitrogen, but release more phosphorus, because phosphorus is in excess. <coughs> Likewise, when it's eating high N to P food, it should retain the phosphorus, release the nitrogen. That's how they maintain homeostasis. It's just another statement of mass balance. So these things became curvy. They're not lines, they're curvy. And then there's a whole family of curves here. Each one of these curves represents a different N to P of zooplankton. And when I wrote this model many years ago, I, I really truly remember thinking, I don't really know what the N to P of zooplankton is. I hadn't read Redfield yet or Ketchum. Um, I, I don't know what the N to P of these zooplankton are, but they're probably all the same as each other. So I'll just pick a family of curves, and at some point someone will tell me what the N to P of zooplankton is, and then the whole world will lie on one of these curves. Um, Turns out that's not how the world works, um, but it was how I was thinking at the time. So homeostasis, key point, it inflects these relationships. That actually generates all kinds of interesting theoretical things. It creates more complex dynamics of the closed system, even to the point of multiple stable states. Um, and uh, again, we didn't know what zooplankton n to p was, so we guessed. Then the last big piece of the puzzle, at least for me, was this study that, that came out from Tom Andersen, not him, not him. There's a Tom Andersson who's here and we'll talk soon. And then there's Tom Andersen who's Norwegian um, and worked a lot with Doug Hessen. Um, and they came out with this study where they actually did sort of laboriously pick different zooplankton out of lakes and measure the nutrient content of different zooplankton species. And especially the phosphorus was quite a bit different. You had the copepods at low phosphorus content and the daphnia at high phosphorus content and other things in between. And that kind of contrast between copepods and clodocerans, it's, it's of course way more complicated than this first simple graph would indicate. But overall, that still kind of holds up. The adult, especially calanoids, are low P species. The daphnia are high P species. And therefore, they're, and nitrogen sort of does more or less the opposite thing. So the N to P ratio of these different species is different. Well, that really exploded uh, this world because then everything came together. So then a bunch of us sat down, Doug and Jim and myself, and we put all this stuff together, looking back at the ELSA at all, trophic cascade work, the Anderson and Hessen data, my model, and we put it all together, and uh, the N to P recycled by Daphnia Magna is here, but the NDP recycle of the copepods is down here, and that actually, was, we were able to sort of post-predict the trophic cascade work that Elser um, uh, uh, had come up with. So all these fantastic things all kind of all came together in a way that, I don't know, I, I, maybe some of you have had this happen to you scientifically, where all these big ideas all line up, uh, but it was a fantastically exciting time when that did. So that's kind of the, the real foundation here. Um, the building blocks we've established, species and ecosystems have multiple roles. Uh, we predict complex dynamics with relatively simple mass balance relationships. And I guess I want to emphasize organisms are biodiverse and alive. Uh, they're, you know, they, they behave like living things. They aren't little passive little transducers. Um, so that was the bulk of the background. I want to mention a few other things and then a little bit more newer stuff. Um, I got going mostly doing lab experiments, and this is a picture of one of the chemostats in my lab. All four of these chemostats have the same species of green algae in them, but the algae are growing under different ratios of nutrients and growth rates. And so we could take one species of algae and really manipulate its nutrient content and then feed that to Daphnia. And, uh, so these are all 10-day-old Daphnia obtusa, um, and uh, they've all eaten the same amount of the same species of algae, but the algae were grown under different conditions. And so under low nitrogen 
Uh, the animal's small. It has a couple of crappy eggs that'll never hatch. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, that's phosphorus limited daphnia. I mean, th these animals can barely swim. They're really, they're really compromised. Uh, low nitrogen, we've got a medium sized animal with one embryo. Um, and then here's the animal that's eating replete food with lots of nitrogen and phosphorus. It's on about its third clutch by now. Lots of healthy eggs. Um, so if we're going to build a food web model, even knowing the species of algae and how much is there and the species of zooplankton, we're not getting very far with that kind of model because the nutrient content plays such a strong role in that ecological interaction. I can skip that in the interest of time. So uh, this is just a graph to symbolize the overall relationship of the stoichiometry of the lower part of the food web greatly influences the production dynamics of the upper trophic levels. And you'll hear more about that from other folks. Um, a point to make today, I think especially, again, about biodiversity, we're living in a time when our ability to describe biodiversity has exploded and continues to explode, uh, whether it's barcoding or various omics approaches. Uh, you know, we are, we are we are scientists now at a time when um, we can grab onto and understand the, the genetic and uh, community diversity of organisms in ways that was never able to be done before. So this multidimensionality problem is getting worse. It's great that we're doing this so we have a much better understanding of biodiversity, but uh, the days when you can just put a few little boxes together in a graph, those days are almost over. We're all going to be doing this kind of thing pretty soon. How do we, how do we cope with that? Um, so uh, this, this amplifies that point about different zooplankton have different nutrient contents. This is kind of repeat of the information I gave you. The N to P of the zooplankton's here, the C to P of the zooplankton's here, and the different species line up. And in fact, you see there's variation within species but the variation across species is much larger. Uh, this is, again, the homeostasis story. Um, some of that nutrient content relates to biochemistry. So especially in small organisms, say a milligram and smaller, the phosphorus content is very strongly related with the amount of RNA in that organism, and therefore its growth rate. So high growth rate species have high phosphorus content. So this is RNA against growth. It's not stoichiometry per se, but um, when we ask what's the biological explanation for that interspecific variation, some of that is driven by life history and um, RNA because RNA makes up a lot of cells. Um, in large organisms, let's say in fish, um, RNA is not important in determining the amount of phosphorus in a whole fish. What's important in fish is how much bone is in that fish. Some species are very bony and even have uh, a lot of phosphorus in their scales. So they're, it's a very structural story. Uh, this is work done in my lab some years ago. And what's really cool to me is uh, this Heather Hendrickson did this. Every dot here is an individual fish. Um, and she measured calcium and phosphorus as well as other things. And the, Calcium and phosphorus in whole fish is very tightly <coughs> correlated. Um, if there's more calcium, there's more phosphorus and vice versa. And in fact, the slope of this relationship is 2.3, which is basically the exact same calcium to phosphorus ratio in appetite mineral, which is in bone. So in fish, it's all about structure. So there's, there's evolutionary pressure on biological function that's creating the stoichiometric variation across species. That then feeds back to the ecosystem in ways that we've already described. This is one of my favorite studies uh, of Mike Vanny's, um, uh, along with uh, colleagues. Uh, Jim Hood came and worked with me, and he comes up in a few minutes later in the talk. Um, this is the N to P excreted by different consumers uh, against the N to P of their bodies, of the N to P of the consumer and the N to P excreted. And these armored catfish, which is an example here, if you've seen them in pet stores or if you have an aquarium, you have these armored catfish, Placostomus. They're super bony, and they have really low N to P in their body, and they excrete really high N to P. 
whereas the tadpoles are down here at this end. Um, I, I should admit that uh, I show you these beautiful examples, and you can go to the literature and find examples where people have tried to repeat this or done similar studies in different groups of organisms, and it is biology. Often the answer is it depends. Things don't always work out as beautifully as I'm showing you here. There are counterexamples, and then you wonder, you know, is it an appropriate test <coughs> organism and all kinds of things. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of giving you best case in a lot of these uh, studies. So anyway, these species fit into food webs in different ways. Uh, whether there's a high P or low P zooplankton seems to uh, correlate with its abundance in nature. So here's the C to P of Ceston or the food, and Daphnia tend to be very abundant when C to P is low. So when the food is phosphorus rich, we'll find a lot of Daphnia, and we find few Daphnia when C to P is high, so when the food is phosphorus deficient, and that's a high P animal. Uh, a relatively low P animal shows no such relationship. So in, at least in this case, there seems to be a good correspondence between the abundance of this species in nature and the simple measure, which is phosphorus content of the organism. Um, so this is the point again. There's been some great successes. I do want to say, I'm, you know, there are studies that, um, that uh, counter, counter, contradict some of these findings. And um, that's one of the things that keeps Jim and me from writing the second edition of the book. The second edition would be so fat and complicated and full of caveats. And well, this study showed this and this showed that. And, that's not as much fun. Um, so uh, quickly now to wrap up. So here's our, our critter again. And I talked about this delta, the growth. Um, so it, imagine the scenario where the animal isn't growing at all. Zero growth, which happens when organisms starve, for example. There's barely anything to eat. They're still ingesting, but not enough to make up for metabolic losses. So they don't grow. If there's no delta, then what goes in has to come out. There's no flux of nutrients into this biomass pool. Um, and so this differential between what they eat and what they excrete is very dependent on the magnitude of this delta. And so this is a model that shows that, um, I won't go into the details, but basically it's very hard to make a starving animal care about the, anything but energy. It's just trying to stay alive. Growth is not the premium. It's just maintenance that, that's, that matters. Um, so, uh, you know, that's an important thing, and it tends to get kind of lost sometimes in the discussions. Um, the last study I want to talk about is the newest one. This is my former PhD student, Jim Hood, who performed this Herculean study in, uh, at Minnesota in my lab, culturing different species of zooplankton and different foods and then measuring kind of the full stoichiometric um, complement of food and body and other things. So here's all these different species of Daphnia. These are just species of a single genus. Um, and this is their body phosphorus content. And um, low, um, uh, I forgot what S stands for. Switch treatment, they, they were switched back and forth, and high end P, or high phosphorus content. Anyway, the, the body content of the animal does vary with the food it eats within some bounds. Um, so if the animal's eating low phosphorus food, its body content's here. If it's eating high phosphorus food, its body content's there. But he got interested in these patterns across species and came up with some really cool stuff. Um, I'll just switch to the last graph because it's my favorite uh, and I want to wrap up. Uh, this, to me, is um, one of the things that I've been involved with recently that I'm most excited about, and I'm presenting it today partly because it appears hardly anybody's read this paper yet. <laughs> uh, it hasn't been cited very much. But this graph, to me, is super exciting because we have this complex multidimensional problem of multiple substances, multiple species. How are we going to deal with all that complexity? What Jim and I were able to figure out was across all these species and across all these food treatments, the specific carbon growth of the animal, that is essentially D carbon, carbon DT. It's the proportional change in carbon in the new growth of the animal. 
uh, and DP PDT here, all these treatments lined up. So carbon and phosphorus were linked in these species in a way that's revealing some kind of underlying rule of life. The carbon and phosphorus are linked and very much dependent on growth. So it sounds like that's my cue to end. So take homes. Ecological stoichiometry is based on rules for linking elements during growth. These feedback and production dynamics and ecosystem properties. You'll hear about that from the other speakers. And the art of making things just complicated enough to explain patterns, but not more so, remains a challenge. Thank you. So you, you show the difference in how different species of Daphnia are basically strategizing around carbon, phosphorus, and nitrogen. Can you, have you been able to link any of that variability to their life history? Is, is you know, a narrow range of variability yeah. somehow more important in a, very, you know, a constant environment? Or Fantastic question. That was, in fact, the kind of prime motivator for Hood when he did these studies. And we were hoping we would, uh, gather data that helped us understand the benefit of homeostasis. Why, you know, what are homeostatic animals really good at? We, we failed at doing that. We weren't able to do that. These interactions of, well, phosphorus content um, was related to growth on low phosphorus food, but not high phosphorus food. Um, so there were some life history linkages, but they didn't, scream at us in the data. They were pretty subtle. And some of the things that we thought sure we would see, we didn't see. So um, I feel like we still have a partial understanding of that linkage between life history strategy and stoichiometric uh, content. Um, I guess that's a short answer to a question that could be, you know, there could be a lot to unpack that question. Uh, are there times when animals are out of homeostasis? Yeah, when animals are out of homeostasis. Yeah, so um, the way we define homeostasis is very empirically. We plot, it's log log, but who cares? Uh, we plot the, phos the nutrient content of the organism against the nutrient content of what it eats. And in the hood example, a few of those Daphnia species were as homeostatic as we could measure. We could not push their phosphorus content, no matter what we did to them, in a way that we could measure it. So it's, it's very constrained. Other species in the same genus were more flexible. We could easily measure differences between them. So homeostasis is not a yes, no thing. It's a shades of gray thing. Um, and then, again, it makes, we have to deal with that so now homeostasis becomes a function of the, let's say, the species and of the nutrient that we're talking about, because it won't necessarily be the same for phosphorus as iron and nitrogen and other things. So rules like the ones that I finished with that pull all this down into some simplification are, I think, where we really need to be. Um, and that's one of the frontiers for sure. Thank you for a very stimulating talk. I'm wondering if you could help me think about how this works, how the regulation of the excretion works. Is that a, a bulk feature that you see at the end of the day and they lose a lot of yeah. pee, no pun intended, in the morning? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Well, biologically, that homeostatic regulation could occur multiple places. And let's say a fish or a complex metazoan, it could occur at the assimilation stage. So if the body's phosphorus rich, we may uh, downregulate enzymes, you know, that catabolize foods and bring phosphorus into the organism in the first place. Uh, it could happen post-assimilation, where uh, the organism takes up phosphorus, whether it needs it or not, but just excretes a lot. Um, all of that happens. Um, 
and it depends on the circumstance. But one study that, that I was involved in that shines some light on that, we did an omics study where we, we used a gene chip for Daphne and we asked what genes were up and down regulated under these different conditions. And under low phosphorus food, many, many genes were upregulated and most of them had to do with carbon processing. And so, in effect, we, we've been thinking about these animals as uh, trying to adjust to low phosphorus. But in fact, at the genomic level, more adjustments were being made to process what was effectively the excess carbon. Um, so it's like almost like phosphorus is kind of a baseline, but the animal's up and down regulating its carbon metabolism. There's, I'm sure, a lot more that can be done on that. Um, Tom, at least, uh, maybe, maybe a couple of other speakers too, will talk about in copepods fecal pellets versus true excretion. And so in things like copepods, you have, you know, if it's, if it's prior to digestion, then you would see some interesting relationships between fecal pellet content and food eaten. But if they digest anything, and everything's post-assimilation, then you wouldn't see that in the fecal pellets. You'd see it in the, in the soluble products. So uh, um, this is a case where biology is complicated, and all, all these possibilities exist, and there are examples of all of those things in the literature. Do we have any insights into the impacts of gelatinous species on ecological stoichiometry? Because their stoichiometry is so different. Okay. I'm going to defer on that one because the Tom or maybe somebody else can, uh, can bring us up to date on that because I, I just don't keep current on that literature. Okay. okay. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Thank you.